45 minutes. Well, it's 8 o'clock. All right. Formal specification applied with TLA Plus. So this is a <coughs> car. It's actually advertising for a car. And if you look closely at that advertisement, it will tell you that it runs on a code. And it does like 50 times more code than in Raptor Fighter Jet, the one that, that governs US. And uh, when I first saw that a few years ago, I was like, what? Because I'm a software developer, I know I go like 160 kilometers per hour in that thing. I mean, not, not in that particular thing, but in my car. I was like, damn, this ain't good. Because if you, if you look into Wikipedia, actually that jet runs on uh, almost 2 million lines of code. And that car is 50 more times than that. It's like one, 100 million lines of code? That can't be right. But it is. It is 100 million lines of code on average. It runs on 50 to 70, no, sorry, 70 to 100 microprocessors who are all connected through a single bus. So this is like a little distributed system and, and, and you're, you're in it and you're driving really fast on the highway. Uh, so I see you laughing, you're confused because your software developer is like, really? I'm selling my car. Um, but it's fine, right? It's, it's a software industry, I mean, software industry, car industry, like we can rely on kind of industry. Well, we can't. Uh, this is Jeep Cherokee, and uh, there were two guys, white hack hackers, they convinced this journalist from Wire. They told him, like, drive this car, we'll try to hack it. And they did, and this happened. Uh, sorry, this happened. And then basically, they based their, their little work on this paper. There were guys in Japan, they showed that pretty much every car you have, you can hack it through the uh, GPRS that they have right now. The, the thing that you, you use when you have an accident to call this, this, this central thing for, for those people to help you. Unfortunately, that thing communicates over this, this bus and, and can, well, you can pretty much do anything. You can stop the car, uh, turn on air conditioning, or in case of that Cherokee, uh, basically turn off the engine while there was a trip, huge track behind this journalist. Anyway, it's still all fine, right? Because like, it's all research, white hacks, who cares? Well, some people didn't care and uh, this thing happened, um, accident, unintended acceleration. Which isn't really funny because people died. It was like a passenger who died. There was a, a tri um, trial, and um, it was up to NASA to look at the Toyota code and look for look for whether it is possible that the unintended acceleration happened because of the mistakes within the code. Ten months later, NASA is I don't know. Like they spent almost a year and they couldn't really say whether there was an error in the code or not. When the trial started, there was another group of experts hired. And they pick up where, from where NASA started, and after 18 months, they finally found there was like basically spaghetti code. But don't laugh, like, who didn't write spaghetti code for your rock? Like, it's like, we all did it. You, you may lie to yourself that you did it, but you did. Um, and then, like, there were cases where a single flip and a bit in memory could cause unintended acceleration. Uh, so, I guess this is a little bit scary. Um, Back in 2014, and, um, and Washington State in the US, uh, so like things like Seattle and all that, they had a situation where they had um, uh, 911 not responding. And the reason for that was that the whole state was basically, the whole 911 was being run on a single system that was run in Colorado. And what they did, they were a little bit not aware of that the integers can have bounds. And they, and they had like a little counter that was uh, summing up how many calls happened in the system. The problem was that that counter was also used to create unique identifiers. So once the number became the, the negative number, all hell broke loose and people couldn't really connect for like a few hours and nobody really knew why. The scary is that the company who wrote the system really, really put a lot of effort so that system be reliable and that didn't help them out because there were just a issue that they didn't think of. They had all the cases how to deal with problems, but unfortunately that wasn't one of them. Uh, in July 2015, weird, like some weird events happened early in the morning. First of all, uh, the trading system for the exchange broke loose after the update of the system. It didn't stop, to stop working. The whole New York exchange was just not working. Uh, Seattle 911 went down one more time. And uh, the United Airlines was actually grounded, completely grounded. Their system was, the part of their system was down. So at that time, early in the morning, they, they felt like, holy crap, this is happening, like Hollywood, no. What actually happened was, it was all a coincidence. Um, 
which is one more time scary because we run so much software that these things start to happen. Uh, the famous, the, the famous uh, machine to do radiation therapy through, through the radiation to, to cure cancer, uh, as it turned out, was actually killing people. I think like six people died because of it. Uh, and uh, at this point, this isn't good. So the problem that I'm making is that software becomes uh, part of our life before we even know it, it runs in our smart watches and all the like, fridges and all that. And it used to be, and you know, there, there might be things like you cannot really tie your shoes. Uh, sometimes, like in Poland, you cannot use some smart bolts because the longer they are working with the new law. But most of the time, it's unfortunately our fault. And the reason for that is because we have this attitude come on, it's software, it'll break. Just don't deploy on Friday and it will be good, right? But uh, that is a little bit of problematic. Because as you saw, software may kill, it may even kill people. And it might be that we as an industry right now are where the, we, we had that first presentation here where, uh, where the speaker was talking about um, uh, regulations in the, in the pharmaceutical industry. They happened for a reason, because they were reckless. The same way we are reckless right now. So, um, you know, you, do you want to have like a special degree that you, which you can lose and you will never be a software developer again? Probably not. Well, the answer, like when a few people had answers for it, Uncle Bob put a huge blog post about it, and basically in that blog post he's saying like, we need more discipline. And uh, I like this quote that Uncle Bob is saying that solution to, you know, not writing bad code is to not write bad code. And I, I think this is pretty much stupid because like, well, Uncle Bob will always tell you that everything, like every problem can be solved with tests. I agree that tests are one way of reaching correctness, but not the only one. Um, the problem really is that we, we tend to, we are right now in a state where our, pro, uh, our programs are really, really huge, and our brain is at this point incapable un of really grasping what is going on. One of the blog posts that I read, and I really like the metaphor, was that the software developer is like a chess player who spends 80% of its time while playing trying to, to relocate where the pieces are instead of really focusing on the game. And, uh, so the, the, the thesis of this talk is that there is this thing called formal methods that actually could help us. So there's like a definition about what formal method is. It's, it's about being rigorous and strict and, and trying to prove and, and uh, verify that the thing that you wrote actually will do what it's supposed to be doing. Um, there is a, a very nice paper and there are YouTube videos about it as well. I will try to really quickly go through it. Uh, not going into details if you're interested, the paper is available. So what happened was uh, they had a, like a project with, um, uh, with DARPA in, in the US and the hypothesis to prove was that the formal methods can actually help with software security, with, sec um, with security backs with the <coughs> software. So what they did, they had the two teams of specialists, red team and blue team. Red team was uh, uh, people who are, well, pretty much uh, white hackers, uh, white hat hackers. Uh, the blue team was people who were specializing in formal methods. So on the phase one, on the phase zero, they tried to prove that there actually is a problem. So they took to two little machines. One was an uh, open source uh, 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 quadruper. The other one was actually a, a, a helicopter from Boeing. And they, they proved that pretty much you can, you can uh, without physical access, just by, by, by uh, wireless, you can connect to both of the machines. Boeing experts were surprised. Um, and they could, they could completely take over over the machines. So that was a little bit scary since those already were used on the field by the US Army. Um, on the phase one, they took this little open source uh, um, uh, flying machine and they, um, they started re-implementing the functionality and they re-implemented the whole functionality using formal methods. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into details of what those were, but pretty much after 18 months, they, they had a system where which was uh, proven that you are not like it was proven mathematically that you cannot really uh, hack into it, and they had majority of functionality. I think they were just missing like what one like 20% of uh, GPS functionality, but not the core one. So, uh, and what happened was that the red team then had six weeks to hack into it, and they were not able. By the way, red team had access to the architecture, had access to the code base. They were, um, they were going through an 18 months period and they were always aware of the changes and, that, and decisions that the blue team was making. So that, that got, that got uh, DARPA excited and uh, really quickly they actually, they actually 
um, made Boeing engineers, uh, uh, there was like a transition of knowledge from the blue team to the Boeing engineers and uh, 18, 18 months later Boeing re-implemented their design and um, the red team couldn't hack to that helicopter as well. So that, so the end of full story there, the presentation, the one, there was one, one last year, the code mesh, pretty cool. Well, anyway, uh, the question is, that is, that is for me, that is actually awesome. Like you, you have this software which was supposed to be secured, it was created for the army, and it wasn't. And now, 18 months later, you have people who like, who were completely unaware of formal methods, and they could use that and re-implement the whole thing, and that it was secured, and nobody could really hack into it. That was pretty cool. So the question is, why are we using formal methods? Well, well, one of the reasons is that uh, code verification specification is pretty much hard. Uh, this is like this is from the paper I mentioned before uh, on this X um, axis. You have like how easy it is to learn this thing from very easy to like number of PhD years uh, per per lines of code. Mm -hmm. And here is how much strength and correctness you get. So things like type system dependent times are considered little safety and very easy. So you can imagine, you know, the, when you rock, you know, skyrock to, to like PhD of, of you have cognizable and that's pretty cool and you can get a lot of verification. But in a world that we live with, a world which is which is agile, where we like not always know what we're doing, right? Because like writing, specifying software that's supposed to be secure, security is pretty much well known. It, it's, it's well understood. The problem is well understood. We don't tend to write. I, I mean, we, I, when I say mean, I, I we I, I guess I say majority of us here in this room, we don't write security software and stuff like that. We we try to understand what the hell the customer wants, and we want to provide them stuff that will actually work for them. Not, but they don't even necessarily know at the given moment what they're doing. So in that environment, it's really, really hard to implement formal methods uh, and formal specification for your code, especially since that is hard and it's like a, a learning curve is, is pretty much um, hard. So, so to sum it up, the software is everywhere and it packs everything. Um, software is too complex to comprehend for a human being. Uh, things will break and there is nothing we can do about it. So that is pretty much it. Thank you very much. Questions. All right. So, uh, well, well, so I'm here to talk about a very specific tool uh, that I hope I will, I will at least try. I don't know, probably will fail, but I'll, I'll try. We'll try really, really hard within the next however minutes. Um, that. It, Probably, maybe it's worth investing uh, a little bit of time in that tool. So we can think about um, formal verifications in two terms: the code verification and system or design verification. Stuff that I've been showing before, like type systems and all that, they all are a little bit in this realm of code verification that you verify that the code is doing what it's supposed to be doing. But there's also formal specification and verification of the design not design of the system before you even write any line of code. So to give you an example, imagine that you try to implement a, a banking system, okay? People want to send money. So here you have you have Bob that will try to send money to the to, to Alice. They're using our system that we are right now designing and we're thinking, okay, so it's gonna be a system, there's gonna be like variables in that system representing how much money each person has. So when Bob connects to that system, he says, I, I just want to send $2 that is being recognized here in this little variable. And then there's some sort of verification checking whether, uh, but whether Bob has enough money to send that money to Alice. So if that is valid, then this, little, this is subtracted from his field and that travels over the, the, some sort of message queue and eventually Alice gets this money. Is, this is good design. Anyone in financial business? I would say it isn't, but for many reasons. But one of the reasons is if things start to run in parallel, all hell breaks loose. So even so, even if you properly code the system, even if you write unit tests, property-based tests, hell, you will go with formal verification of it. This design was flawed at the at the beginning. The design was bad. So you made an upfront, you made decisions about the system that are not valid, that will make your system, make your system do wrong things to the, your customers. And the majority of those bugs, and the, the ones I will be focusing on, are the bugs that happens on distributed systems or the systems that run concurrently. 
So your code might be correct, but your design might be broken. You might be thinking, well, wait a minute, we have tests, right? It could be that even if our design was wrong, we would hack it, and then we would have tests, and tests would show the failure. Well, unfortunately, that's not always the case. And a good example is this. This is back from the old extreme programming uh, times, and they had those little challenges. And one of the challenges somebody proposed on that wiki was that here's you, ha you have a little bit of Java code. Don't focus on that. I know it's Scala group. But um, there was a, a, a simple put and get, and they were supposed to run in parallel. And the guy said, there is a bug here, and the challenge is to write a test that will find that bug. People spent weeks on it and couldn't find it. There are people were experts trying to show up saying this code is correct. What the hell is this kind of challenge? So later on, the guy shows exactly the steps that you need to reproduce the problem. And he says, like, listen, now that you know how to reproduce the problem, now that you know what the problem is, still the challenge is to write tests. One guy did it after he measured 16 hours of pure work. He finally wrote a test that required 11 threads, 250 executions, in order to, for this test to, uh, to fail sometimes. OK? Do you understand the problem? The test will not help you if the design is incorrect. So we would like to verify the design before you even write code. And you might be thinking, holy shit, that has to be really, 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 really hard. And I, I hope, how much time do we have? Like, I need to know. 20 minutes? 30 minutes? Someone tell me. Mm, maybe about 10. 10 15? <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll try. Uh, so TLA class here for the rescue. By this guy, I'm going to. Like Lindsay Lampert uh, deal with it. You can read about it. So, um, so he had this idea. So it's like it's not really his idea, but the idea is that every concurrent, every distributed system you can design. You, sorry, you can re represent as a sequence of steps, sequence of sequential steps. So if you have two threads doing one thing, you can still show like, oh, we started with in this state, and we will either go this way or that way, and you can represent the whole overall number of states using sequential sequential commuting. So. So uh, this probably looks a little bit like that. So you, you have this concept of a state. Your program is in a given state. So you take all the variables that are within your system, how, compl how complex that is, and values of the variables in that given point, point in time represent your state. You have actions, so, so those are edges between states, uh, and they represent this kind of graph. So you might have state start and, and another one, and this, there is going to be like action task is created. And lastly, you have behaviors, where behaviors are, we, we understand behaviors are sequence of actions. So, so they represent like multiple steps that can happen in your system, potentially infinite. Now, uh, I choose this little um, image to, to kind of explain the concept, but your system is more probably going to look a little bit like that. So, and this is actually a very simple system if you think about it. The number of states that your even simplest program uh, represents is enormous. It, is, it explodes. And, and the idea here is, can I look at that <laughs> graph? I could, I could look at this graph and I could tr uh, try to find, I don't know if, it's, if I have, if I have, I have a slide in a second, I'll show you. I can represent two things. I can talk about safety. So I can say, hey, there are some rules in which my state cannot really be in. If I'm writing that bank application, that the rule might be no overdraw, right? The, the amount of money in the bank account has to be zero or more. And I can say what that rule is. I can provide a property, I can provide an invariant that I would like to hold in any of those states. And sometimes my have questions about some, some sort of lightness properties. So I might say, hey, given that I'm here, I would like to eventually be here at some point. I don't care how, I only care what I intend to do. And this is what TLA, so TLA plus is a, is a language to specify your design. And that's, that's all what it is. That's how Leslie Lampert, Leslie Lampert, do you know the story about Paxos? He had like at least three different approaches to explain the algorithm, which is pretty much simple. But instead of like, using better English, he just wrote a tool for specification and math, I guess. Well, his student wrote a TLC, uh, a so-called module checker. Do you know what TLC stands for? 
Nobody knows. They, they forgot. Like, they, they ask questions in the group, nobody remembers. Probably temple layer logic checker, but nobody really knows. So what, what TLC does is it's going to understand your specification when you're going to write it with TLE+. I, don't, I know I haven't shown you TLE+, I will do it in a minute. But imagine that you have a language that uses symbols from math where you, represent, you specify your system, and TLC understands this language, builds up the, this graph of states, and that just runs the brute force through it. It just goes from state to state. It looks, hey, I'm in this state, and I'm able to, do, to go to that, that state. If I am, fine, and now I'm at this state, and let's move forward. And while it's doing it, it will check those properties, it will check those invariants, and check whether your system is correct. So I talk about safety and alignments before. It uses maps, so it uses a little bit elements of logics like and or uh, negation and implication. Um, also like there exists and uh, for all, and um, a little bit of set theory, so like empty set, elements exist in a set, intersections, unions, and those are things you probably are a little bit familiar with. There's also using two symbols from temporal logic with those look weird, right? Uh, it's almost like Unicode didn't load up. But, um, <laughs> but those symbols represent, this square represents something which I say always. So I want to say always something is true, no matter what. And the other one says eventually. So eventually this thing is true. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, but since, like, and there's like an ASCII representation for it and this is you're gonna see in the code base in a minute because Lambert. Um, but yeah, let's, let's go back to those states. I uh, have to go uh, quicker. So the idea was that we will create an initial formula. So initial formula represents the initial state of our system and then we provide a formula that will say, given you're in this state, and there is another state over here, can you create an edge? Can you go from this state to that state? And are the only two things that you represent in TLA plus. So I, don't, I, I told that TLA plus isn't really used to represent programs, but I, I use that as an, as an example to kind of specify how like reverse engineer the specification. Given that we already have this program, how the specification look like for the code, even though I said you use rather TLA plus for the design, not for the code. So you have an integer that starts with, uh, with value five, and then you assign to this integer one of the elements in that list. So how many states do you guys think that there are at this point? So the first state will be that initial state, like hey, we are the, uh, the values equal x equal, equal five. And now let's say we have three elements in that list. What can potentially happen? X can be the first element, the second element, or the third <coughs> element. Right? So all together, there are there are pretty much there are pretty much uh, four straights. And this is this is a little bit of TLA plus code. But given the time limit, can I can I ask you kindly that maybe we'll just skip for TLA plus? Because if you really want to learn about TLA plus, you can always do it online. What I would rather try to sell is the idea what you gain behind it. But let me quickly go through it. So you you have some modules that you 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 can pretty much import some constants so that candidates that we have here that list is going to be our candidate that we a list of candidates that we're going to provide into the specification we also say there are some list of variables here's a variable x and as i said we will provide two formulas the formula that creates the initial state that starts the program and the formula that allows that, that allows us to go from one state to the other so the initial formula and that formula we're saying that x well it was supposed to equals five sorry a mistake it was supposed to be five here and i also created this this sort of like internal variable to, so I understand in which step the, the computations are so the so, so program counter is running and then I say uh, that you can, you can say, so you say x is equal to 0 and pc is equal to running uh, you can also use this sort of like uh, little synthetic sugar so two ends close together and then we say what next, what does it mean to afford the, how can you go from one state to the other, what we were saying is that if your variable PC is in the state running and X and that's how you so if you have a variable X when you when you use this little hyphen here you, you means you you're referencing the value in the next state so you're saying the value X will be in a set of that candidate so that that is the list then and then we will say that the PC the new value of PC will be stopped and that's all it is and then you run the TLC and it will go through that graph and it will recognize there are just four elements. So 
just really quickly, you guys probably know this game, right? The idea is that you have to take all that pile over here and put it over here. The problem is you can only take one thing from the top and you can only put it either here if it's empty or if the thing that the, the, the circle that is already there is bigger than the one that you're trying to put there. So we could write a, a simple TLA. So this is like a dummy example just to familiarize guys with the syntax, but I just want to show you some like little crazy things that you can do with, with TLA. So you can, so we can say we have two, uh, three variables, all of the, uh, so tower one, tower two, and tower three. All of the va those variables are sequences where two, the tower two and tower three are empty sequences, and uh, the first one represents those little circles. And then we say, what is the value, uh, uh, valid uh, transition from one state to another? So we say we can either pop elements from tower one or from tower two and from, or from tower three. Okay, what does it mean to pop a, an element from tower two? You either pop it from tower one and put it on tower two, or you go from tower one to tower three, right? And then we can, we can then reason what that, in, for example, would means to go from tower one and place it on tower two. Where we saying that, well, tower one cannot be empty, has need to have an element. Tower two is either empty or tower two is not empty and the first element on tower one is smaller than the first element on tower two. And then we say what will happen, what has to be, what, what the, the next state has to look like. What are we saying? Well, the next state uh, in tower one, we only can have the tail of tower one, and the tower two will be concatenation of the head from tower one with what was on the tower two. And we say that the tower three stays unchanged. And we will have all that representation. And this is right now a TLC toolbox. This is when you can run the model checker. So that's the pretty much the code base that I showed you. I don't know how much you guys see that will say with me. So you create a new model, you name it, you provide the initial formula to be that init formula and next formula that we just defined, and you run the model checker, and it says all is good. And it will tell you that it found 81 distinct states. So it, run your it runs your specifications and just go through all the possibilities and it's saying everything is correct. Why everything is correct? Because we didn't really say what incorrect is. We could, for example, we are trying to solve that puzzle, little puzzle so we can say, hey, let's say that one to three cannot really happen on tower three. Because if it can, the TLC will check out, will recognize that as an error and it will give us a counter example. So that's what we're doing here. And there's like a little checkbox here called invariance. So we add a new invariant, which, and you, can I zoom it? Maybe I can? Eh, I don't know if that helps, but anyway, we're saying there isn't, so there's like a knot here, there isn't a situation where tower one and tower two are empty, and tower three looks like that. So when I, uh, when I run this thing with that invariant, uh, TLA quickly finds a counterexample. So it gives us a number of steps based on what we wrote, and basically right now it seems like there's like 16 different steps that the system has to go through to reach a situation where finally here, finally here is, um, hopefully I can zoom it, where it reaches the state when tower three has those elements. But as I said, ah, given the time limit, um, I, have to, I have to go quicker. So, um, Remember that Alice and Bob, and now I have a little bit of code from TLA plus, but don't worry, the details will be hidden. We will only focus on the, the general element. So remember, as I said, design here is broken, right? Let's prove that the design is broken before we write any ACA code or whatever. So we have, what we have is constants, like initial amount that Alice has, initial amount that Bob has, some clients that represent Alice and Bob, and like maximum amount of money that will be wired. There were variables like Alice, the Alice messaging queue, and then Bob's and all that. Initial state, initialize that Alice account to initial state. So the typical initialization, nothing really fancy here. The important part is the next stage formula. So we are saying the things that can happen with the system. So we can either Alice retrieve some money from, the, from that queue, from that message queue, or Bob, or there exists a client exists a client in a list of clients, such as either using that client Alice is preparing a wire, or using that client Alice is wiring the money to, to Bob. And the same thing applies for Bob as well. 
Now, we can add those invariants that we are interested in. So we are saying that always, always <coughs> Alice needs to have a zero or one money on her account, and the same goes for Bob. So now when we create our model, and we put those values, so we have a one single client here for both Bob and Alice, and we put those invariants that I just mentioned in the model checker, we run it, and everything is just fine. The system doesn't find really much errors. But if I extend this model and I said that the Bob has two clients, well, those are represented by strings because in that level of design, in the level of subtraction, I really don't care what the client is. When I run it with two clients, I you know, run it, I immediately find a case, a sequence of steps, exactly 13 steps, where at some point, Bob has minus two. Uh, pounds on his account. Uh, so, uh, really quickly, if you guys know event sourcing, you guys know event sourcing on CQRS, right? Imagine that you don't know it, and somebody has this idea, like, oh, you're gonna have this list of commands, and they're gonna be validated, and uh, if it's valid, or if it's not valid, we remove it, if it's valid, it's gonna create a series <laughs> of events. Those events will, will end up in the view, eventually we're gonna have that, that view, right? This sounds familiar, uh, you can represent that as TLA, and as I said, I will not go into those details, like client generates a command, or system validates the command, or system updates the view, and there will be like little details within the TLA itself. But I can say, while we're designing, while you whiteboarding your super solution about CQRS, I can, I can create an environment, I would say that event store has to equal view. And if I run it, it fails, because there will be cases where view is inconsistent with the knowledge within the event store, right? But what a TLA stands for temporal logic of actions. So that, that temporal logic is the thing that we're gonna use here right now because we can provide a formula that is a little bit more complicated and that says that for every possible event that we that ever that we can ever can be generated by the system, whatever that is, if that if that event is in the e store so event store, then eventually, so this sign is means like leads to, that will lead to that eventually that event will be in your view. So you can check that on this on your design whether this will be a case and if it, if it won't, you will have you will have a counterexample before even you write any code. So uh, promise four minutes. So the examples that you will find, so those are the riddle examples, and I was hoping not to go into the code itself because the TLA plus isn't really that complicated, but you guys would be bored to death given the fact it's almost like half past eight. But uh, the, the seriousness is that a lot of serious errors and bugs could be found or were found using TLA plus. If you are a little, a little bit into Crypto market, you know, Ethereum, there was the serious, there was a serious DAO error. So there was a smart contract uh, which throws like 50 million bucks on it. Uh, but, and the, the smart contract was, this is pseudo code representing that smart contract. And it wasn't really that complicated. And people were using it, and then there was a bug which was exploited and helped. People lost their money. Now, the funny thing is that you can represent this code with TLA plus in 35 lines of TLA plus and it will find you that error immediately. Also, fixing that error can be also represented in TLA plus in its 38 lines of code. So three lines more to get the assurance that the, the smart contract will, will behave correctly and there will be no errors. Xbox, when they were producing the first Xbox, they had the kernel, they had the memory <coughs> system from the IBM. Just to show you that the TLA, so the idea behind the stock is that the TLA, I know formal methods are scary, but TLA, TLA plus is easy as hell and anybody can use it. At Microsoft they had an intern. The intern was making coffee and it was like really, really bored and somebody said like, hey listen, we have the software for IBM, maybe you can learn about TLA and specify it using TLA plus. And he did. He, he needed like two days to pretty much learn about the specification. Then he specified the IBM system and he found a bug which would freeze the console after six hours of playing. IBM was shocked because they said they had integration tests, but those integration tests didn't spot that error. And that error was, wouldn't, wouldn't be found with TL Plus, that would, they would miss the shipping during Christmas. The, the, the stuff that landed, that landed Rosetta 
uh, on that little comment. They use TLA class as well. And they also approach the TLA class as beginners. They were just C programmers who happened to code Rosetta. And they heard about this TLA class, they spent like a week learning it, and they were able to shrink their code to 10% of its original size, simplify the design of their system, and still <coughs> land in the freaking comment, which I find amazing. Um, Leslie Lamport later commented that, that, that you, can, you can improve your code by so many ways with using code techniques, but there are, like, if, you're, if you improve your design, the code automatically becomes improved. Um, and the, famous, the most famous paper that started it all was when Amazon actually used that, uh, the TLA class a few years ago. They found uh, errors in S3 in Dynamo. One error, I think it was in the Dynamo DB, it required 35 steps to the bug to occur. So 35 steps of execution in Dynamo DB to actually for the bad error to occur. Now interestingly, the guy who was really excited at Amazon about TLA plus, he knew that if he's gonna use, if you're gonna say TLA plus, the next question is gonna be, what does it mean if he's gonna say temporal logic of actions and everybody will run away? If he's gonna say formal methods, everybody's gonna run away. So what he said, he created workshops which he called uh, testable pseudocode. And everybody got excited, oh, it's testable pseudocode, let's do this, right? And they did, and they have uh, this majority of issues. And if you look at the specifications, okay, 800 lines of code, of TLA plus code, you might think that's a little bit, well, it's a lot. But if you think about it, it's specifying the whole freaking S3. Well, parts of it logic at this particular case for tolerant low level network algorithm. That is just amazing. And what I, and here's another example. This is actually pretty cool, cool um, talk to watch when, when uh, uh, Hilal Wayne, he shows that he, the, 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 the team he was working for, they were not hackers, like they were not formal method experts. They were just mobile phone developers who were struggling because they were writing a system and at some point they had to update their system on the mobile apps. But there was an error on those devices that you couldn't really upload the app, install the app if it was already installed, otherwise it would crash the device. And they had to do it quickly, so there has to be a synchronous, but not too quickly because the system would crash. So they had all those little constraints, and they were like, okay, they, you, all right, this is too, too much. Like, this is new. What can we do about it? And they, they learned till the plus from scratch and had success because they found a temporal bug. So they found a bug which would not immediately explode the system. <coughs> it would happen eventually. And they estimated it would take a lot, a lot, a, a, around a week for the bug to occur and probably would cost their contract if it really happened. So, as I said, uh, I just wanted to really try to sell you guys is this idea that before you go to, the, to work, you know, next week after a weekend or whatever, you might try to, learning about TLA Plus is not really that hard. Leslie Lampert has an amazing uh, video course about it and it's really, really awesome. It's fun, it's, it's, uh, it's weird sometimes, uh, but essentially it's really funny and uh, and TLA class is not a really complicated, and you don't have to implement Amazon, you don't have to put stuff on a comment, you don't have to program commerce. You can design your systems, and you, can, you will have your client whiteboarding the solution, and why he does it, if you're, ha if you're starting becoming efficient in the TLA code, while he draws the solution, you can hack it, and before he's done, you will say, well, but, and you can show him the counter example that his design is actually not correct, which I find amazing. Um, why is it better than tests, for example? Well, one of the things that you get is, imagine that you're trying, imagine that for a minute you're implementing something like, for example, consensus protocol on a distributed system. How can you tell with tests uh, in variant that, for example, a single leader can only be elected? There never can be a time in the system that there are, like even for a moment, that there are two leaders elected in a given system. How can you tell that? With TLA plus, because it, the distributed system is <coughs> flattened to sequential steps of computation, you have this God view on the whole system and you can tell, you can put that environment and say in any time, if this algorithm is run, I will never have a situation where there are, when there are not two, uh, there's only like more than one leader elected, which by the way is impossible. Um, so, uh, 
PLA class will not generate their code. So don't look for a solution like, hey, I will just design the system and magically it will generate code. It's not for it. So yes, if you, you make a specification and then you have an issue transporting that specification to a code, you're gonna have that time. But I'm saying is that, so this is the argument. You always make a model when you write software. You always do that. You just do it in your head. Well, you're, you're really good if you're whiteboarding. Maybe you write specification. 99% of us don't do any of that. They just have, they're, they're in their coffee. I'm, I'm making coffee. So listen, I'm going to have this microservice and they're going to communicate over Kafka. I'm going to send you that message and you're going to process it. Okay, yeah, sure, man. Thanks. See you in an hour. Right? And that's the whole model in a kitchen design, right? And what I'm saying, so you have that model in your head. Nobody starts coding like, I'm just gonna write type characters and see if it compiles. You know what you're doing. It's in your head. So there's always a possibility that you will write a bad software. There are, there are errors, so you need code reviews, you need testing, you need property testing, you probably need type system. Uh, well, it's a hard statement, but I'll claim it. You need type system. And, uh, but still again, before all that, it would be nice to understand whether the design is actually correct. Uh, and there are ways, but there, there are some ways that how you can transport the, the specification of the design. I'll not go into that really quickly. Uh, you can specify something very abstractly. You can specify a system at the very beginning how your client described it. Like I have this microservice and we send this message here and that message is processed here and I use this and happens to be here. And you can write a specification that will say that and not much details. Then you can write a specification of the system where you already use terms like Kafka or, or message queue or whatever. Like, like you're already providing implementations and that and then you can say this specification implements that specification. If this specification is valid in every step, it will be valid on every, uh, uh, on every step in that specification. And you can, you can push that through this abstraction as long as you really, really want. So that is a, a this is called a specification refinement. It's really, really cool mechanism. Uh, now, resources. I didn't have time to put resources on this slide, so I promise I will update it, and I will put it on Twitter, okay? Now. Lastly, this is the talk I promised myself five years ago I will never do, meaning I don't have yet production experience with TLA Plus, right? It used to be I, I read about this thing and I did the presentation the next day, which was stupid. I said, like, I will never do that again. I just did it, okay? So, so I don't have a production experience from TLA Plus. I only have what I've learned and what I've heard from other people who use that. But I've been playing a lot with this thing for the past two months, and it's really, really promising. And I encourage everyone here to kind of spend a little bit of time trying to at least give it a go. And maybe it will click, maybe it will not. My name is Pavel Schulz. I love being in London. I have to move to London eventually. Um, thank you for having me here, and thank you very much. Woo!